Coming up on this edition of Doc Talk, we'll be talking with Dr. Kyle Schmidt, a neurosurgeon at the Monument Health Neuroscience Center. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me today is Dr. Kyle Schmidt, who is a neurosurgeon at the Monument Health Neuroscience Center. Welcome, Dr. Schmidt. Glad to have you on, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks for having me. You bet. Um, were you a were you a curious kid, Dr. Schmidt, when you were growing up? I uh, did a lot of stuff, but yes, I was curious. Curious. Uh, your your background, though, you come from kind of an agricultural background, don't Correct. you? A little bit. Correct. From Western Nebraska, Gordon originally. Okay. A couple hours south of here, so farm and ranch. Plan was to go do that. My parents told me I had to get a job, <laughs> and uh, always liked the sciences and went to med school. And originally thought primary care. Right. But I love surgery and I love neuroanatomy, so it all kind of came together for neurosurgery. Well, that's quite a leap from your parents saying go get a job. Most kids would be at. Taco John's, McDonald's, somewhere that you went right to. Uh, what was the, why Why did this interest kind of pull you in as a kid, doctor? Well, I love sciences. I love biology. And so I really liked medicine. I liked being around people, talking to people, working with people. And so all that led to the plan for medical school. And then once I got into it, like I said, originally thought primary care, because I wanted to go back to a small town, ideally yeah. in Nebraska, or in the western half of Nebraska. Sure. And then once I got into it, Felt like the neuroanatomy and surgical stuff was just too great, and started down the road and never quite got off the train. Did some of that? Uh, did some? Of, is that because you kind of worked around animals, you know, growing up, or was that where that curiosity kind of kicked in for it a little bit? Probably. I've always I've always found all this stuff fascinating. Yeah. Just biology of everything. Okay. Great. <laughs> well, let's um let's let people know a little bit about what a, a neurosurgeon does and kind of what you specialize in. I think a lot of people when they hear that term. Um, you know, that's a term that uh, if you need a neurosurgeon, uh, something in your life probably is 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 pretty serious at this point. And, and, and maybe most instances or some instances. Yeah, in the trauma world it is. And I tell folks, my friends, they say, well, if I'll call you if I need you, I say, hope you don't need us, but we're here if you do. Yeah. And so for neurosurgery, what we do is management, it's surgical management of neurologic conditions. So neurology manages multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease with medications. Neurosurgery gets into the brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerves. We do some carpal tunnel or what they call peripheral nerve tumors, but it's largely spine surgery, spinal cord, nerve roots, uh, disc, degenerative disc disease, wear and tear, and then mm -hmm. also brain conditions, tumors, aneurysms, trauma, and anything of the brain or spinal cord that can have surgery, that's what we do. Is it is it a subspecialty of medicine that's, is it still kind of a, a growing field? Is it is it really well understood or not? Not quite. It, it is still growing a lot, yeah, okay. and we don't understand a lot. <laughs> why? Why? I mean, I, you're dealing with the brain. You're dealing with nerves, right? You're dealing with the spine. Um, do Do you feel eventually we're going to get a handle on this? Because it 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 is super complicated, obviously. Yes, and I think technology helps with any of this, where you advance things and you learn more as advancements come out. You know, a couple hundred years ago, people thought certain parts of the brain controlled dancing and another part controlled singing. So right. we've come a long ways just in general. Yeah. And and as we're able to do more, and, and, and quite frankly, our, our overall critical care is better to keep people alive with serious health conditions, that you keep people alive that used to not survive, and then you see how they do and see how the brain or spinal cord is injured and can recover, and you think, wow, 100 or 50 years ago, we thought this stuff was non-survivable, and now we have people living and recovering. And so there's a lot we don't know or old thoughts of, hey, this isn't recoverable. You've had a stroke. You're just going to not do well. That's not entirely true. So what are then what are the most um, what are the most common injuries you see and treat here around Rapid City in the Black Hills? And are there any are there any that are kind of unique to our area? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so so in terms of what we do from an injury standpoint, we do a lot of trauma call. We're a level two trauma center here. I know you've had mm -hmm. a few other general surgeons on here, um, Dr. Weasel, Dr. Witteroff, those folks. So we work with them from a trauma standpoint. We do with deal with head injuries. So motorcycle wrecks, just mm -hmm. had the rally. Yeah. Car wrecks, bucked off a horse. Any of those things, we see people have climbing at, uh, accidents who fall, hit their head. And then spine injuries. So Spine injuries due to whether it's high school sports, which you don't do a lot of surgery on those, but it's more high impact injuries, car wrecks, ejected from vehicles, 
unique to the Black Hills. Uh, ATVs are very common in the summer, and mm -hmm. we have a lot of people come here who don't ride them very often. They rent one and go out in the Black Hills, and here we are. We got a lot of people that uh, come to the rally that way, too, I Correct. think. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that, uh, that are new to it all, and, and the rally's not really an amateur time to be a motorcyclist, that's for sure. Nope. Uh, you guys must, you guys staff up pretty pretty hard for, the, yeah. for that two-week run of that? For the rally, we actually yeah. have two neurosurgeons on call all the time, oh, wow. which is uncommon but we do it okay uh you were you were just on call here uh last night i Correct. believe too so I'm, I'm glad you're here oh, yeah. and alert and awake and Fancy, you would, doing, you, fan, doing great <laughs> you wouldn't take any coffee this morning which leads me to believe that uh you're you're good at this you're uh, used to this at this point right it gets in your blood <laughs> yeah. um you know when people obviously when there's a traumatic injury you know, uh, you're either uh, you're either running to the hospital in an ambulance, or you know, you know that there's damage and something has happened. But when you have things like general back and neck pain, how soon should anybody reach out to you or their general, you know, their primary doctor that could lead to them talking to you? Yeah, so that's a great question. We get that a lot, and we try to not start with surgery, obviously. Right. So the most common thing we do. From, for most neurosurgeons, unless you're at a big academic center where you specialize in brain tumors and that's all you do, the spine stuff, neck issues, low back issues, is probably 80% of your practice or more. So that's mostly what I see on a, on a daily basis in clinic. Most back and spine pain is due to arthritis, wear and tear. And uh -huh. as Dr. Buck mentioned, uh, usually you see your primary care, you try Tylenol, ibuprofen, those type of things. The the time you get to us is af typically after you've worked with your primary care doc, after you've done physical therapy, and after you've tried injections. And is that six weeks down the road? Some people, it's several years down the road. And the challenge is, if you know anyone who's had neck or back surgery, some people say, geez, this was great. And there's other people who say, I wish I'd have never started down that path. And they've had six or seven surgeries. And it's not that I think folks were doing the wrong surgery. It's that you're trying to help people. And when you look at the neck or back, there's so much going on bones, discs, ligaments, there's so many moving parts, and pinpointing the exact cause of pain is really tough, which is why I tell folks surgery is the last step. So do right. everything else. We're happy to see it early on, but typically working with therapy, pain management, and your primary care doc is the way to start. Okay. Uh, is there, is there a, when, when, when surgery is, is, is recommended and, and you go in and, you know, take care of them to the best of your ability, um, the recovery process for this has to be vastly different for almost anything you do. So if you have a, a, a brain trauma or head injury yep. or something like that, what does is, what is a recovery time look like for something like that? Yeah, so it really depends on what you have. Right. And so starting with the head, if you have a traumatic brain injury, you know, people are in the hospital usually for several weeks, and then it's usually rehab after that for weeks or months. And it's often six months or a year down the road before you can say, hey, this is completely where you are. Okay. It, it used to be people would say, geez, a month out, you're not doing well, probably not going to, this is where you're going to be forever. We've learned with our rehab folks that, geez, if you give people a chance, they can recover fairly well. Now, along those lines from the head standpoint, that gets real tricky mm -hmm. because there are some people who they recover fairly well based on numbers. They're able to walk, they're able to talk, but they may not be the same person. So your question about recovery is a fair question. How that looks on head injuries is 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 challenging to determine. Was was rehab was that always a part of these type of surgeries? I, it seems like uh, in talking to to a lot of these doctors that that's becoming more and more important. Uh, not only for you know physical rehab but mental rehab too. When it comes to stuff like this, are you seeing a lot more of that with your practice as well? Correct. Yes, and it, and getting people to rehab sooner and then letting them be involved longer if possible, if they need it, is 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 undoubtedly helpful. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Uh, you know, I can't imagine. Well, I can't really when it comes to you know brain trauma or spine surgeries or thing like that, where a lot of people. They don't want to do it because I'm sure it's painful when it's done, right? I mean, a, a lot of these surgeries, minimally invasive or otherwise, yep. are still going to cause in those areas when you're dealing with nerves, right? Yep, that's correct. And, and the trauma stuff is you, you're presented with a problem. You have to deal with it. Now, the more elective stuff, per se, the neck and low back, recovery from that, to your, your come about probably is a lot different than other recoveries. If you have neck or low back surgery, especially if you're talking about a fusion, putting in hardware, rods, screws, or those type of things, those are big surgeries. Mm -hmm. And- Usually folks are in the hospital, depending on where it is, a day to several days, sometimes longer, and then some folks still need rehab. 
I think a challenge with neck and back issues are people have often had pain for a long time. And when you talk to their family members, they say, geez, they haven't really walked well for several years. So people are used to having shoulder surgery or any of those other surgeries where they say, geez, I was back at it within six, six weeks or three months. With neck and low back stuff, usually people aren't doing well for years. And so thinking you're going to have a big surgery on the back and then be back to normal in three months, really, you've probably been out of commission for several years. And yeah. So a lot of people after these big neck and low back surgeries say they're not back at it for six months to a year till they really feel getting back in the swing of things. Now, uh, we mentioning minimally invasive uh, surgeries. You know, you, you obviously have dealt with some very big surgeries that happen. Um, is, is a trend... Do you guys try to find this more and more ways to do this minimally, correct? Absolutely. And it seems like that's getting better and better and better as the technology advances. It is. And some of it is, so for example, a disc herniation in the back. You don't need a fusion. You don't need all that. But it used to be at a pretty good sized incision. Now our incision's about an inch. You go in, you use a microscope, slip out the disc, surgery's about an hour, hour and a half, and typically home the same day. And so the goal of all this is you're trying to minimize tissue destruction to get down there and not disrupt too much bone or ligament once you get down there to take care of the problem. Now, the trade-off there is people seem to do better if they do well with it. On the flip side, sometimes you need to do bigger, but sometimes you start with a smaller surgery because if you can, get a, if you can be successful with that 90% of the time, we'll take that 10% where you have to come do more down the road. Wow. Uh, it's, I, I can't wait. I, we're going to talk with you uh, in another podcast coming up about uh, the robotics that are playing a big part in, in hospitals and surgeries anymore. And I can't wait for that conversation. Um, there, is one, there is one very curious procedure. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but over my years of being on the radio, I've had a handful of these stories pop up with this particular type of injury. And I'm amazed that anybody can live through it. Okay, I won't keep you in this much suspense. Okay, but I'm my, prob- my problem with this is the pronunciation of it. Okay, so here I go. Please correct me if I screw this up badly. An, o- an occipital cervical disassociation. Okay, this is one of the weirdest, strangest type of neuro. Uh, surgical conditions I've ever come across, which is otherwise known as an internal decapitation. Have you ever come across something like this? A couple times. What? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Basically, what happens is it's it's a horrible injury. Yes. And and the reason it's not commonly seen is most people don't make it to the hospital. Okay. Now, our EMS is very good at what they do. Yeah. So they keep people alive because they get there so quick and do so well. The ambulance services policemen, firefighters, all them, where they get people resuscitated and get a breathing tube in them and get them to the hospital where years ago that just wasn't wasn't happening. And so what that is is where the ligaments basically between the skull and the spine, and take a step back, when you think of the back in general or the spine, the reason we can move, do all this stuff is partly bones, but it's largely ligaments. So the right. ligaments of our neck and back are worth, I mean, they do a lot of work. And in these high impact injuries, which we seem to have more of those because we all drive faster and make more <laughs> <course>. poor decisions. <laughs> and we're on um, our phones. <clears throat> yes. Mm-hmm. No, um, it's where basically the skull and the spinal the spinal column gets stretched and those ligaments get torn. And so is it decapitated in the sense where things aren't connected? No, they're there, but you basically st- stretch, right. stretch things where they're not supposed to go. And in addition to that, usually there's other head injuries associated with that. People can survive this, though, What I, is what I find most fascinating. They can, but, but it might be some major issues. Yeah, but you have actually seen a couple. Oh yes. boy, that is that's terrifying. Honestly, it and the reason again, I bring it up because you know, in in finding interesting things to bring to to radio or podcasts, this is one that a lot of people tend to bring up and be like, how how can that be possible? How can that be a thing? Right? But I'm so glad <laughs> that you've cleared this up for me and that it's it's it's. Uh, you, you you put a reality to it because a lot of the stories you see will be that people have had the surgery, they survived, and they're okay. But I can't imagine the ramifications no, the oc- from coming something like the that. The occipital cervical issues, a lot of times those folks don't survive, or if they do, are severely, severely debilitated. Right. And I think that's a tough part of our job where we all try to find the balance of – there's, there's times doing more surgery or doing surgery isn't the answer. Mm-hmm. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think that's a discussion, especially with traumas of 
if they're if they're if they're a super independent person, regardless of age, do they really want to go down this road? Yeah, and that's a tough question to answer. But really, you're just trying to make sure that person's wishes are respected because. I've seen people who say, I'm, I'm okay having problems being in a nursing home. And there's other people who say, if they can't have a six pack and a fishing pole, they don't want to be alive. And that's okay. Right. You just want to make sure you don't prolong something for months or years right. where they don't want to be. Uh, do you, this might be another kind of strange question, but I think all doctors have a favorite part of their practice. Do you have a favorite t- surgery that you like to do? Ooh. Do you have Do you have one that you're like, yeah, I, I'm, I, and 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 from, coming from the standpoint of because I know I'm going to be super successful in this, and I'm really going to change this person's life. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I really enjoy trauma. Okay, I really do, and some of it's I enjoy big spine traumas, and and the challenge with those is there is several ways to deal with those problems. And from a cognitive standpoint, thinking about those problems, you're thinking, how can we fix this? Yes, 10 different spine surgeons, you're gonna get 10 different answers. Yeah. And, and the, I think those are really, how do I put this? From, a, from our procedure standpoint, challenging, but when things go well, they're very rewarding. Oh, I can't imagine. And similar with, and now with that being said, um, you're trying to keep people walking, keep them functional. And similar with the head injuries, there are some head injuries where you do really big surgeries. Go take out a blood clot, or sometimes we have to take the bone off to give the brain room for a couple months. And uh, I usually put it in their belly to let them, let them keep it in there. Are you kidding? That's, well, where, that's where it goes sometimes? when You can put it there, the bone freezer. Um, but we have so many people come to the hills from other areas if they go somewhere, we put it under the skin in their belly, and then they can, wherever they go, whenever it's time to get it back on, you can have it put back on down the road. And really, I mean, in, in reality, it's their own tissue, so they typically right. store it there. Well, I I suppose that makes sense, although I'm just so mortified that that's where it ends up in your body sometimes. But I suppose it would have, I mean, yeah. that, that, would, that would give you the best outcome. And then, you, right. you, you have... Oh, artificial ones made as well. Yeah. If, but those are, going back to your original question, the the, the big head injuries uh, are, once again, challenging. And, and really, you're just trying to, to give people a chance to survive. Right. And, that, and that's really what I tell families is we can't promise anything here, but we're just trying to give everyone a chance. Sure. Well, if anybody if anybody wants to, to, to go into this, this profession, uh, neuroscience, neurosurgery, uh, are there things that you have learned that you would tell somebody that's starting med school now? To be like, look, he, here's where it's going. Here's what you need to just keep in mind as you move forward. Have you learned some things like that? Yes. It's a long road. <laughs> you know, four years of undergrad, four years of med school, and then seven years of residency. If you do a fellowship, it's another year or two after that. And I think it's, you know, we get caught up in these procedures and how how good can we do this procedure? How not how fast, because ultimately, if you're quicker, you're, it's better for patient safety. Sure. But I think in reality, it's that you're meeting mo- a lot of what we do to your original, one of your comments earlier is, the, the especially with the trauma stuff, you're meeting some people on the really the worst day of their life. Yes. And I think it's good to try to put that in per- perspective and have a sense of humanity of, you know, each person has a life, they have a family, and you need to try to respect all that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's important to remember that and not get it caught up during the training of all this, that, hey, you have a long road ahead and try to stay human through all this. So the cliche of the bedside manner, I mean, Correct. really is what it comes with. Yeah. Well, that's, that is probably the best advice you could give anybody. Yeah, because as exciting uh, as it can be, like you say, trauma surgeries are, are something that, uh, you know, are, it has to be an exciting thing to do, no matter, you know, no matter uh, what the situation is. Uh, but yeah, to understand that, you know, you you have somebody's life in your hands right there. Yeah, and I think going down, I mean, to your, could you get into the, oh, we need to do research and mm-hmm. be, yeah, I think that's any field of medicine. Yeah. I mean, people think neurosurgery, brain, and spine, it, it is fascinating because the brain's something we just don't have a true understanding on. We're learning so much about it all the time. And so we could talk about, oh, you know, you need to keep an open mind of this or that if you want to go into neurosurgery. But in reality, I think at the end of the day, the day anyone in medicine is going to be very inquisitive and oh, of thoughtful course. and trying to think, what can we do to improve this? Do you, do you think at some point, do you, do, you, do you like the way the technology is advancing in this? Do you, do you see down the road where some things now that kind of stymie you? you... I, I think technology is only going to help. Right. And, uh, and hopefully we find technology where you don't need surgery. Yeah. You know, Dr. Buck was on here with pain management, and I think if they could find something where they don't need us, fantastic. One area that we're really seeing technology go is, is not just the spine spine stuff in terms of putting in hardware and quicker surgeries, 
but we do some movement disorders. I don't. I have done quite a few of those surgeries in residency. We don't do them here yet, but where we do what they call deep brain stimulators. So folks with Parkinson's disease or essential tremors. So some of those folks, they try to go drink a cup of water and they're shaking. And if you ever Google those videos, they're fascinating. You should. They are. Where you put an electrode in the brain and literally in the procedure when you test it, their arm goes from shaking to nothing. Yeah. I've seen the ones where guys have, uh, well, men and women, where they're eating cereal. Yes. And it shakes in the milk, and it's going everywhere, and then they turn that thing on, and it's as smooth as it's it's a it's fascinating to watch, and that has to be exciting with that kind of technology. It is, that. and even my seven years of residency, what the technology we had in terms of those electrodes and the programming they had for those when I first started to the towards the end had changed, and it's like everything. The batteries and devices get better, so you need less replacements, and their ability to manage this and and do these things is just fascinating. That's so good to know. It's so exciting. Uh, Dr. Kyle Schmidt, neurosurgeon at the Monument Health Neuroscience Center. Thank you for talking with me. We really appreciate it, Thanks for having me. You bet.